Uh, good morning or uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. So I will tell you, we are from a process control and automation group at the School of Chemical Engineering here in Alto. And I will to tell you something about some work that we have done and, and that we're continuing doing, doing in, in, uh, in how to operate wastewater treatment plant as potentially the water resource recovery uh, facilities of the, uh, of the future. Uh, it's the presentation is about the work that has been done by one of our students, Otacilio uh, Bizarra Lecinato, in and a professor in, 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 in Brazil, Professor Michela Mulas. And the idea is to discuss some of the possibilities to operate wastewater treatment plants as resource recovery facilities and the potentially some sustainability constraint that guide their operation. Uh, the kind of raw material of choice for uh, this problem is water. There is, of course, uh, a necessity to guard the way that we are managing water resources because it clearly we are uh, putting an unnecessary stress on, on, on fresh resources. We are always requesting for more water, whether this is for, for uh, making food, for, for, for ourselves drinking it, or, or for whatever kind of societal needs, of course, we, uh, we use water for. And well, ideally, in, although this is a kind of an obvious statement, uh, we should replenish uh, water resources at the same rate at which we, uh, we extract uh, fresh water from them. But of course, this is more of a statement than actual uh, practice. So the idea is to, try to think of how we should, should rethink the management of water resources in a way that we are responsible in the way that, that we use it. Uh, our interest is in uh, wastewater treatment plants because these are sort of central in a, in a central facilities in a, in a water cycle. And, and they are also a very unexploited, let's say, uh, resource for water. If we think of how much of the wastewater deposit is used uh, this this barely barely reaches the, the two percent. So there is a huge potential for, let's say, recovering water and resources from water, which otherwise would be uh, wasted. Uh, the biggest kind of challenge is our mindset, in the sense that wastewater treatment facilities are designed and engineered to produce a clean water of some kind, so that it can be uh, disposed into into receiving rivers, lakes. And, 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 and for example, the sea. Uh, this process is highly energy demanding. If we, for example, look at how much energy on a global scale we need to uh, operate our, let's say, water facilities, this amounts to, to about 3% of the total need. Of course, this is not only specific to wastewater, but let's say on a broad, much broader sense, but it's clearly a very, very energy demanding problem. Uh, the only thing that we require to the waters that we dispose is that they would comply to certain normative constraints, typically uh, legislative uh, boundaries on, on the emissions that we, uh, that of the effluent that we dispose. Uh, the fact is that, of course, these uh, effluents are rich in chemicals, and these chemicals are extremely valuable, for example, in agriculture and aquaculture itself, and, for example, the sludges are clearly very, very valuable for the uh, production of biogas and then uh, for the production of, uh, of electricity. Uh, the idea is that, of course, you want to kind of rethink uh, the use of water. You don't want to think of wastewater anymore as a waste, but in fact, as a, as a resource-rich uh, material. And of course, that would imply changing a bit the way that we operate wastewater treatment plant, and in fact, operate them as, as, as resource recovery facilities. Uh, ideally, we would like to reduce the costs. We would like to optimize the chemical input. Of course, we would make would like to make this these operations to be somehow resilient to, 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 to extremes in climate and, and potentially also make them uh, capable to generate products that are sellable on a market. Our kind of research st uh, stems from uh, a conjecture uh, that the municipal wastewater treatment plant can be operated as fully sustainable uh, water re resource recovery facilities. Of course, by resource recovery, we mean, we mean that we would like to be able to capture selectively energy and materials from otherwise used streams. And of course, we would also like the, the facilities to be able to kind of take care of their own uh, native task, which is treating wastewater and potentially produce a water that can be uh, readapted for uh, some other beneficial use instead of being just simply disposed into the environment. Uh, from our perspective, what is needed is a 
given an existing facility, some kind of a system level technology that would allow for a full recovery of the chemicals that are in the wastewaters and potentially to uh, energy neutrality, if not, if not positivities. We think that there's the possibility to consider wastewater treatment plants are as urban actuators or control levels that can be manipulated within a urban environment in order to produce water and resources according to certain uh, demands coming from, uh, from, let's say, the city. And of course, the downstream needs in terms of quantity and quality would dictate the way that we operate, that we operate the facilities. Ideally, we would be willing to match demand and supplies. And of course, we always have to make sure that we are uh, within the environmental uh, uh, boundaries. And, and of course, as I told you, uh, operate within some sort of a viability bounds. Uh, our focus is on conventional wastewater treatment plant, which means treatment plants that are uh, that have two main components, an activated slash process and an anaerobic digestion. The first one operates on wastewater itself. The second one operates on the sludges that are uh, uh, recovered after the, 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 the treatment process. And of course, we would like the, 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 the facility to somehow be interacting and interfacing with the natural environments as it already does, but also with the urban and agricultural and industrial ecosystem that are clearly uh, uh, expanding within, within our, our urban uh, setup. Uh, we have in mind a way of controlling and formulating this task, uh, or let's say a way to solve this task as a control problem. We have in mind uh, basically uh, some kind of a decision making machinery that will take care of supervising the operation of the individual units. I will tell you a bit more in details about this thing. And of course, it should be somehow uh, directed by some sort of a planning, which in our mind should be, should be centralized. So we have in mind some sort of a distributed kind of approach to operating the facilities. Uh, kind of important element in our uh, vision regarding this, uh, uh, this, this process is that we have to make use as much as possible of uh, existing knowledge regarding the, the, the processes and, 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 and instrumentation that is typically uh, included in them. So we like to do these things using some sort of a model-based approach and in some sense exploit uh, both mechanistic modules and empirical modules for, for let's say, uh, modeling certain behaviors of the process which might not be fully, uh, fully well understood. So in principle, we have this high level kind of decision system where the system at the unit level controls will in practice determine the set points that would be then given to the low level uh, controllers in the, in the plant. Uh, the important things that are that, that the controllers should of course encode all the technological constraints that are typical in, in an industrial setup, which are mainly related to, to equipment uh, specifications, and of course, some sort of a desiderata, which means that we would like to operate in certain conditions. One of these conditions could be, for example, within certain sustainability, uh, sustainability bounds. And, and in our specific case, these bounds are defined by a set of reachability sets that solve some sort of a Hamilton Jacobi Isaac type of type of min max problem. Uh, I will give you some very quick overview of some work that we have done in one of the specific units of uh, this conventional wastewater treatment plant that I'm telling you about. It's a common activated sludge plant. We work with a uh, with a plant that basically serves uh, uh, 100,000. Uh, person's equivalent. It has an incoming influence flow rate of about 10 to the 5 cubic meters per day. It has the conventional setup consisting of a five bioreactors and one, one secondary settler. The process is the conventional uh, uh, denitrification nitrification process where we have bacteria that will reduce the nitrogen that is present in the influent wastewater uh, uh, and then uh, from ammonia to nitrate and then further reduced into nitrogen gas that is then released. Uh, in the atmosphere. The typical configuration would have a set of uh, uh, sensors, instruments that are typically installed in, in, in a conventional wastewater treatment plants. They would monitor concentrations of chemicals like oxygen in the, in, the, in, the react, in the reactors, amounts of suspended solids, different forms of nitrogen. And of course, there are also a set of actuators that would allow us to 
operated the plant. And typically, these are related to the uh, to the aeration in the in the in the reacting zones. Possibilities, of course, to recycle internally and externally the the the, the mixed liquors and, and and perhaps also the possibility to, to add extra carbon sources. Uh, from a, a control perspective, the number of sensors is uh, is thirteen in our configuration, and we also have uh, thirteen actuators. And of course, there are a set of disturbances that enter mainly in the form of uh, disturbance to the first reactor. And, and of course, these quantities are not measured and let alone they are, they are actionable and, and manipulable by us. And there are 14 of them. The setup is a conventional uh, model predictive control type of structure in which we have basically the task of computing solutions uh, to optimization problems that determine the actions that we should send to the plant given that we have a task of uh, optimizing a trajectory uh, given uh, explicitly in terms of, let's say, uh, technological uh, targets and operational targets, typically explicitly formulated by the management or by the engineers in the plant, unless there is, of course, some sort of a higher level uh, decision-making process, and this is coming from some sort of a planning or schedule. What is important that anyways is explicitly formulated in terms of let's say process terms, so it's uh, understandable by, by the personnel of the plant. And of course, the actions that would be computed by the, by the controllers, they need to satisfy, like I told you already, certain constraints. The main ones are, of course, technological constraints. We have to make sure that the, 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 the limitations of the equipment are satisfied, and of course, some uh, desirable uh, uh, states in the, in the operation of the of the plant should be satisfied. And again, the idea is to make them as explicit as possible so they are fully interpretable by, by operators, engineers, and, and, and management in the plant. Uh, the controller basically consists of two uh, main blocks, a predictive controller on an MPC and a state estimator. And like I told you, because it's important from our perspective that this the decision-making process is based and kind of supported by, by the knowledge of the process, there would be some sort of a model that tells how the the, the, the plant hopefully uh, evolves in time and how the, the instruments are, are, are modeled. Uh, if you look at this uh, schematics, of course, the focus is on the controller, but you can see that uh, basically in the plant, there are only the disturbances that are entering and they are not, let's say, in the ends of the, of the decision-making process. Uh, the decision-making process will receive the references from uh, whoever is in charge for setting the operational targets, and it will compute internally the control actions, making use of the data that are, of course, uh, emitted by the, by the, by the instruments. Uh, of course, the decision-making process de de depends on the knowledge of the state of the system, and for that, there would be a need for a a uh, second module, which is a state estimator. In our case, the all the, 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 the kind of components are formulated as uh, deterministic optimization problems. So they are somehow fairly understandable. Uh, of course, uh, we refer to reference models for a standard uh, plant. We will refer to the activate, so-called activated slash model number one for the bioreactors. And we also have some uh, uh, model for the for the settler, which is the the, the standard ten layer TACAX model. Uh, so the dynamics will be represented by some kind of a uh, dynamic function f that evolves the state of the system in time. And of course, the state would be emitted without fit through uh, as a as a as a measurements which are here denoted as s y. Just out of uh, uh, clarity regarding the dimensionality of the system, the 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 state space is a one hundred and forty five. Uh, dimension in our case, so clearly the system is uh, largely underactuated and, and, and underobserved. So the first thing that was important for us to understand and, 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 and to establish is what are the dynamical properties of the system. I think this is really the, the, the fundamental starting point for the development of this, uh, of this machinery. So we analyze properties like commercial control, properties like stability, controllability, observability. We use a structural approach, which means that we work on on, on properties of the graph, so the state space instead of relying on the let's say conventional common formulation of this of these properties. In a sense, these are stronger properties because they do not rely on a specific linearization of the of the dynamics and the, and the measurements. Given some knowledge on the dynamics, of course, we have to 
to develop the controller. The controller is a standard optimal control type of formulation where we try to minimize some kind of a cost. Of course, it's a cost which is given in terms of computing, uh, stay as close as possible to a given trajectory. Uh, there is what is important in this, in this formulation is basically that the costs can be, again, very well expressed in terms of explicit properties of the, of the, of the process that we want to control. So they are close to the understanding of the operators. And, and of course, also there are some set of constraints on the states and on the controls that are again very well linked to the to the specificities of the process. Um, when the, the costs are quadratics, when the constraints are, are linear inequalities, this optimization problem, once we get discretizing time and solved numerically, is in fact extremely uh, light because it's uh, uh, can be casted as a convex program, so it can be efficiently efficiently solved. Uh, perhaps what is important is that, of course, you already probably noticed that uh, the operation of the controllers depends on the knowledge of the current state of the system and, and the current disturbance, which will be held constant in the definition of the control actions. And uh, of course, for the estimation of these quantities, we will rely on the, on the state estimator. Uh, what is important is that because the cost is expressed in terms of uh, state variables, which are, of course, not directly uh, measurable, and they say not very close to the art of the uh, of the plants or, or operators. We would need a so-called steady state optimizer that would translate the the, the say the the tracking in a, in, a, in in the state variables into a tracking of the of measurable quantities according to the to the wish of the plants. And because in practice, making and synthesizing controllers simply means to stabilize. A process this 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 optimizer is exactly trying to figure out what are the values of the states of the system and the controls that would uh, stabilize our 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 model at least if not the process itself uh, in a very wasteful way in the apc world only the first action is deployed to the system and the rest of the optimization the full sequence of controls and states is is dumped and a new computation is uh, repeated at every cycle uh, very similarly, the problem of the estimation is again formulated as an optimization problem. There would be again a set of costs and a set of constraints that would tell us how to find the, the, the full uh, evolution of the states and the, and the disturbances given a set of past measurements. Uh, in this case, we will not need, the, we don't keep the first estimate, we keep the last one, which is the one at the current time. And of course, again, both the, the optimization would be repeated at every cycle. The idea of repeating at every cycle compared to the standard optimal control that, of course, uh, there are uncertainties in the models. We don't know much about uh, the, the disturbances. Of course, also the measurement would be uh, not precise. So we can sort of protect ourselves by replanning at every, at every clock. OK, this is the full formulation of the, of the problem. Of course, there would be some tuning related to prediction horizon and prediction estimation, and of course, some tuning related to the, to the parameters the, of, the, of the controllers. These are important, especially to guarantee the stability of the controllers, which is very important in, in a process setup. Uh, does it work? This is one problem of optimizing a trajectory, which is given. We ask a plant to produce a water of a certain content in nitrogen. And of course, we have standard treatment and, and uh, super treatment and, and, and very, very uh, light in, in, uh, in nitrogen uh, operations. And of course, we would like to see how it works. I have a small video that I can show you regarding this where I can, I suppose, show you that these are the five reactors. Uh, here we have a set of variables that we measure and we re-estimate, which are the concentrations of NOs and, 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 and oxygen. These are, these are the influence and then these are the, the controls that are created on the, on the, on the controllers, especially in terms of uh, aeration and, and, and like I told you, in terms of uh, uh, additional carbon, carbon sources. And this is the tracking efficiency here on the bottom on the quality of the influence. There is also some interest in looking how the sludge uh, blanket develops in the secondary settlers and, and make sure that everything is somehow stable from a perspective of the, of the evolution. And now you can see after some time, there would be a storm event that will enter the plant that will of course upset. And the idea is that the controller will try to protect its, uh, its tracking uh, 
uh, in spite of the, the disturbances, which are very, very aggressive in this, in this, in this kind of situation. Uh, perhaps a couple of final comments. Of course, this is uh, what we have. We have started looking into the possibility to do the same kind of operations under a, a, a constrained uh, sustainability type of operation. And of course, the idea is that whether we would be able to actually recover the energetic demand to, 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 to run the plant under these conditions directly from uh, the wastage that is digested in the, in the methane. Well, of course, we have started investigating these quantities, and, and there is basically the possibility, according to our result, to at most recover 60% without compromising the tracking, the tracking quality. Uh, I think that I am running out of time. I just want to thank uh, Otacili, who is the main person that has worked on this uh, on this on this project so far, and these are our other researchers, Augusto, Yanni, Oliver, uh, Philip, and Emmanuel, that are contributing in different ways to this to this very general this very general uh, uh, research. Thank you. <laughs>